Welcome to this edition of uh, Westminster Studio coming from Croydon. Uh, today we're going to hear from Chris Clark, uh, the author of a new book that is causing considerable discussion inside the Labour Party and in wider circles. Warring Fiction, which is published by the Policy Network and Roman and Littlefield with the support of groups like uh, Progress, uh, was actually started long before Labour's current troubles. Uh, in the book, Chris looks at, uh, well, the warring fictions, the stories that people tell and some of the things that have led to the difficulties, the polarisation and the conflicts. And as you listen to what he has to say, you'll realise that many of these things apply as equally to other political parties and to populist movements. As I said, he started uh, writing this a long time before the current political troubles, uh, but it's a very pointed analysis and I think it'll help a lot of people understand what's going on. Uh, so from the Westminster studio, I'd like to introduce Chris Clark, the, audit the author of Warring Fictions, to take us through his presentation. Chris. Brilliant. Great. Um, thank you very much, Neil, and uh, thank you to um, Narrowcast uh, Media for having me th here today. Um, and uh, yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about the um, the kind of the main themes within Warring Fictions, um, and particularly about the, uh, uh, the these three central myths: the Dark Knight, the Puppet Master, and the Golden Era, which I talk about and which form the kind of central trio of, um, of the myths that I talk about in the book. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to start off by, talk, by talking for a couple of minutes about how the, the idea for the book really came about. So um, uh, I started writing it in late 2015 or so, and up until that point I had been what you might call a kind of um, a bit of a sort of man on the Labour omnibus, if you like. I was, I'd always been a Labour Party member. I, you know, I kind of uh, knocked doors at general elections. I'd done bits of work as a Labour press officer. Um, but my uh, relationship with the party was quite automatic and instinctive, and I hadn't really <laughs> questioned it that much. Um, and the election of Jeremy Corbyn as leader was a moment when uh, all of that changed for me, really, because I was instinctively really kind of um, turned off by Labour, really, for the first time at exactly the point when large numbers of other people were you know, infused by Labour for the first time. Uh, and as with, I think, probably quite a lot of people, um, there was lots of you know, arguments that I had in pubs with people and I read lots of these similar debates playing out on, um, on social media, at hustings, in television debates. Um, <coughs> and and I, was, I was interested in particular uh, in two things in observing how these debates played out. The first was that we, the people, and when I say we, I, I talk really of the people on the kind of non-Corbynite left within Labour, um, failed to articulate what our real objection was with, with Corbyn and frequently uh, it became, the assumption became that this was about radicals versus moderates, left-wingers versus centrists, uh, and the, the, the kind of tacit assumption, the tacit default assumption being that we sort of wanted, um, you know, a little bit of social, social justice, but not too much. Uh, and that, you know, there were our instinct when we against Jeremy Corbyn was that we were kind of saying, yeah, this far, but no further. You're too radical for us. And that was the, the first thing was that we, we really were struggling to get beyond that. And I never felt that that was true. I never felt that I was any less far to the left than, than Jeremy Corbyn, if your uh, definition is kind of um, believing in social justice. Uh, so that was the first thing. The second thing was we, we sort of really couldn't agree on the, the basic premise. So the arguments that I was watching take place um, were, uh, they, they were not really arguments about, um, you know, we think the top rate of tax should be this you know, 50% and you think it should be 65% or substantive things like that, um, where you could agree to disagree, it was a whole different analysis. Um, so, you know, my perception of, of Jeremy Corbyn was that he was a kind of politer George Galloway and I would be talking to somebody who regarded him as a, a kind of modern day Keir Hardy. I would 
regard New Labour as a, a broadly progressive social democratic project, and they would regard it as a kind of quasi Reaganite <laughs> kind of um, uh, kind of uh, entity. Um, I would regard the Guardian as a kind of centre left or left newspaper, and they would regard it as a kind of kind of part of the mainstream media. So the, there were so many of these non secateurs and it was a little bit like watching a football match and afterwards sort of having a conversation with someone about it and wondering, were we watching the same game? Um, so the, I came to believe that it was this, the, um, the kind of analysis and world view where the real difference lay between the two sides of Labour far more than it was the substantive difference between degrees of how left-wing or how radical or how progressive you were. Um, and the, the, the real problem with Corbynism was this populist analysis, not that it was, you know, too socialist. Um, so I was going to go into the myths, but just really quickly beforehand, I wanted to talk about what I mean when I talk about being on the left. Um, so this is obviously quite a, a lot to fit into sort of a little 45 <laughs> second nugget. But I will, what the reason why this matters is because if if the argument is that the difference between these two factions within Labour lies somewhere other than how radical you are or how progressive you are, then, you know, what is the castle on the hill that we, we can all sign up to? Um, and my sort of definition of that... OK, so yeah, my definition um, was very much based on the philosopher John Rawls, who I won't go into in lots of, lots of, lots of detail today, but um, was a philosopher during from the second half of the... Uh, the 20th century. Um, you, a lot of you might be familiar with some of his ideas, but his central argument was how would you design the world if you didn't know which individual you'd been born as within that society? Um, if you didn't know your social class, your nationality, your physical health, your gender, your how much inherited wealth you'd have, even what generation you'd be part of, what type of society would you want? And his idea was that an objective society would be a fair society, and that there were really three components to, to this equal rights, so absolute equality of rights between individuals, equal opportunities, so absolute equality of opportunities, and fair outcomes, so not absolute equality of outcomes, but um, fair outcomes based on people could only earn more than other people if they um, were clearly contributing to society and supporting um, the poorest people within the society. Uh, and I believe that that is a definition which is progressive, absolutely consistent with Labour values, and which really, once you strip away everything else, um, is a kind of umbrella that everyone from a member of progress to momentum could kind of sign up to. They might start to differ quite, quite rapidly about where, <coughs> uh, you know, how you get to that society. But broadly speaking, as a, an ideal, I think this is, you know, as a definition of left, works quite well. Um, so, the... Uh, if we're striving to reach a society which is based on equal rights, equal opportunities and fair outcome, then I believe that there are three populist myths which fundamentally cloud our judgment uh, and get in the way of us being able to achieve these, these kind of goals as a society. Um, so I call these myths the Dark Knight, the Puppet Master and the Golden Era. The Dark Knight refers to an evil right-wing enemy against whom our battle is destined to be played out. The puppet master describes an elite shaping our lives uh, and the golden era describes a glorious socialist past, uh, a kind of an idea of original socialism which we've deteriorated and declined from. Um, and these myths feature just as much on the populist right if you look at Trump's slogans about making America great again or Boris Johnson's language about the will of the people, it absolutely taps into them. My book's focused on the, um, on the, the populist left because I'm, I'm on the left and I think it's important that we sort out our own backyard, basically. Um, so these myths are very psychologically powerful and they tend to sort of really reinforce each other. Uh, and I've bought into them at certain points when I was, when I was younger. Um, and I think that they're, but they're, they're absolutely visceral and powerful stories um, and they've really m emerged to the surface in a quite a dangerous way since um, 2015 within the Labour Party. Uh, and th they, um, what they, as I say, what they profoundly do is they stop us reaching equal rights, equal opportunities 
and fair outcomes, and they lead to results like December the 12th, uh, where ultimately they facilitate, a, they, they facilitate kind of reactionary and counterproductive ideas. So the first myth, to go into it in more detail, is the um, dark night. So I've got a sort of collage here that I've, I've put together of, of some different examples of this myth in action. What it really is, is the idea that the political spectrum is a moral spectrum um, of white knights versus dark knights. Um, I mean, I, it's knight with a K, so it's a kind of like the kind of medieval knight that you are destined to always clash against. Um, so it has a whole set of political others, a whole set of bogeymen, the bankers, the Tories, the Blairites, American foreign policy, whatever it is. Uh, and what it does is it ultimately says on every single issue, it becomes a moral issue. So it becomes a question of which side are you on, to quote the, the, the protest song. Um, even quite small policy issues become massive moral clashes. Uh, and what this myth inevitably leads to is to sectarianism, to dogma and to extremism uh, and to, uh, you know, betrayal narratives of the kind that mean that uh, become totally farcical uh, and to some of the kind of enemies, enemy is my friend positions, which Labour has been so, um, so which Corbyn in particular has been so guilty of in the past and which have been provided so much ammunition for the, the, the media because he's consistently seen the world in this great Manichaean struggle and, and chosen his sides and sided with people who actually aren't particularly progressive or left wing. Um, so uh, it's, it's, there's a whole set of oppositions um, based on class war, cold war, more recently culture war um, and specific oppositions be it Palestine, Israel, Russia, America, public sector, private sector, uh, trade unions, business, um, Republicans in Ireland and unionists in Ireland, um, working class versus middle class, but everything is ultimately a set of oppositions and being on the left is about taking sides within those oppositions. Um, and uh, I mentioned the kind of class issue, that's a classic example where the, the, the dark night means that um, the populist left tends to see class as a, a struggle against the two sides. I've got the quote up there of, towards the right of, um, you should rise with your class, not above it, which is actually not a particularly progressive idea. It's the idea of a, a tiered society in which people, people don't, don't, don't mix and it's not very socially fluid, but it's because it's based, everything is based on this idea of struggle and clashes between groups. Um, so yeah, that's the Dark Knight in a, in a nutshell. What I should stress is it's not, it's not just about civility. A lot of people talk about civility in politics, um, but I don't think, you know, John McDonald called the, the non-Corbynite MPs effing useless. That's not really an example of the Dark Knight because it's him, him talking about um, the others, you know, the people being rubbish or incompetent. It's fair enough, it's rude, it's not very helpful. But what I'm talking about more is the idea, much more deeply ingrained, that people vote Tory because they don't care about other people or that Blair writes, to quote one of Corbyn's outriders, I believed in nothing except money. These kind of ideas are the things that fuel this kind of uh, Dark Knight mentality. So why not the Dark Knight? There are four main problems with the Dark Knight and each of these are reasons why it is firstly counterproductive and why it is secondly um, often quite reactionary. So the first is that individuals are complex and contradictory and we can never judge the whole by a part. So it's perfectly possible for someone to be um, a bisexual BME working class Tory who reads The Guardian, works as a banker and wants less immigration um, for the sake of argument. Um, and there's th those kind of complexities and contradictions are within every single member of society and actually society is becoming more complex, people are more, you know, more multi multifaceted in those ways. And the but the dark night which breaks things up into whether it's class war or whether it's political us and, us and them or whether it's, you know, bashing certain groups as being a kind of part of an enemy, enemy group. What it does is it always ultimately breaks, breaks people down into singular identities uh, and means that 
it's very, very clumsy and that you're dismissing whole swathes of society and, by the way, dismissing whole swathes of the electorate who you need to win over who might not be who might be non-progressive on one particular issue, but you choose to focus on that issue and make it that they're part of the enemy, that's not a good way to win people over to vote for you. The second problem with the Dark Knight is that people throughout society are products of their life experiences, including us. And this is one of the interesting things about the Dark Knight, is it's one of the areas, is it, b politics is one of the few areas where people who are on the left, who generally believe in um, nurture rather than nature and that's why they're on the left don't allow for 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 nurture and are inclined to to judge people but who've just simply had very different life experiences as being de facto bad people um it's no coincidence that the majority of people vote for the sim same political parties as their parents majority of people who've of different generations have different values and the dark knight completely overlooks that because it says you're a Tory and nothing else and that's what you are. The third problem with the Dark Knight myth and with the kind of ideas of us against them, good against evil struggle that it encourages is that no policy carries innate worth and to think otherwise leads to dogma. So this is the part of the Dark Knight which is more doctrinaire rather than um, uh, sectarian but what it is is that a whole set of issues are aligned as ha bit having innate moral value so for instance rail nationalization a lot of people talked in the uh, after the election about how that was actually quite a popular po popular policy with the public but why 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 it wasn't popular because corbyn was associated with it actually the reason for that is that corbyn is a believer in this kind of grand struggle uh, and the impression he gives is that he believes nationalization on every single issue is and they, you know, that his enthusiasm would be limitless. Mm -hmm. um, and th and that's, that's where people don't trust him, even though on this particular issue, they might support rail nationalisation if they think that he believes that th it is inherently good, then people, aren't, people want their politicians to be able to weigh up the individual merits of things. Um, final point is uh, personal mo morals and political values are not the same thing. People can have different values to, to my own and still be perfectly moral people. They might be, place more emphasis on tradition, on personal responsibility, on visible success or on, secure, on their personal security. Um, and those are not bad values and we should be starting to, we should be trying to judge people by the kind of real moral tests of would they, would they help a young mum carry a pram up a flight of stairs, not assuming that because somebody has genuinely more traditionalist values that makes them a, a bad person um, and I think that that's a, a key thing and a key success of left populism in in the effect it's had on Labour has been to um, to constantly take every policy difference to a level of values and to take every values difference to a level of morals so the fact that Liz Kendall believes in cutting the national debt means that she's a Tory and the fact that she's a Tory reduces her to the moral position of scum and then get the Liz Kendall's Tory scum and that's before you know it you've cut to the very core of a person's character and of everyone who supports them because, because through refusing to recognise the differences between values and morals and policies. So I'm now going to move on to myth two. This is the puppet master. Um, and this is the idea that um, we essentially we live in a thinly disguised dictatorship, not a roughly functioning democracy. Um, it regards most problems as being visited on us from above by powerful elites. And it basically says that governments don't oppress willfully, they mediate badly. So it's the kind of the thin end of the conspiracy theory wedge. And if you look up in that top right corner, there's a quote by um, Owen Jones where he says today's establishment is made up of powerful groups that need to protect their position in a democracy, a democracy in which almost the entire population has the right to vote. The, the establishment reps an, a, an attempt on behalf of these groups to manage democracy so it doesn't threaten their own interests. So this view of the world is essentially that all of the world's problems are authored, they're the products of design and they come from above. And that's, there's a, a, the language that it implies uses agency and design uh, and intent in everything that it does, whether it's 
Co coercion, propaganda, agendas, a rigged system, manufactured consent, social control, elite interests, oppression. The whole language implies that somebody is doing this to us and that, th that the whole of society's problems are to a degree authored. So though a lot of left populists would disavow the full-on conspiracy theories of the kind of ideas about 9-11 or the moon landings and stuff, they basically well, they go for the, 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 the kind of thinner end of the conspiracy theorist wedge. Um, uh, and and the, the, to, to emphasise the puppet master is not just about <coughs> conspiracy theories, as I say, it's a, a general overestimation of how powerful and how, how powerful the powerful are and how cynically they use that power. Um, so what the other kind of big problem with the, uh, the puppet master idea is that it leads to oppositionism and to opportunism because it doesn't think seriously about the limits of government and the limits of what, what powerful people can do because it believes that ultimately there are no limits uh, and that you really it's a case of getting into number 10, turning the inequality dial down, switching the poverty button off and, um, and it's really as easy as that. So it's never left, the populist left is never really equipped to govern in the way that it um, could be because of this. And a lot of the ideas about the MSM and the mainstream media and the failure to navigate the mainstream media, which is not actually a, a puppet master entity, but is largely a kind of commercial entity of people trying to sell products, news, news products to people based on their values, is a fundamental failure to understand how the media work uh, because of this puppet master way of seeing things. So, again, there are four major problems with the Puppet Master. The first is that few people possess the inhuman, superhuman traits needed to control society for personal gain. The majority of people can, you know, just about manage to, to sort of uh, get up on time in the morning and get to work and stuff. So, wh who are these people who are inhumanly callous and superhumanly competent, who are able to... Um, manage democracy so it doesn't interfere with their own interests, to use that quote. Uh, and the problem is that you have to ask some quite difficult questions about how, who those people are, how they've managed to find their way to the top of society. Um, and uh, ultimately, it would, when we look at ideas like Labour's anti-Semitism crisis, it fundamentally stamp, stems from the fact that a small number of people buy into the puppet master and their answer to that question, they've got a ready-made question answer in the form of the Jewish community because they say, oh, it's this, th there's an, they're the inhuman superhumans over there. So it's very hard actually for Labour to get rid of its anti-Semitism problem until it stops talking about the 1% the pulling the strings and, and brainwashing us. Um, point two is that there are self-evidently different electoral and policy priorities within our society which the powerful must juggle. So the the electorate want lower taxes, more nurses, less immigrants, lower inequality, greener communities, more compassion for refugee, refugees, cheaper petrol, more, and th that list could go on and on. And the, 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 there are interest groups who promote those different diverse causes and who manage to have a big sway over the discourse. Um, so you have to answer, ask yourself what sort of unaccountable plutocracy has to split the difference of myriad different competing demands. Um, and the conclusion is that perhaps it isn't quite as powerful as all that. The third problem with the puppet master is that the real issue with unregulated capitalism, and like I say, I'm, I am on the left and I don't, I'm not somebody who believes in, in rampant free markets by any means, is that it is essentially an organic and anarchic thing. The, the you know, unregulated capitalism sweeps sweeps um, kind of wealth into already deep pockets without really anybody, any puppet master being needed. It's, um, it's a, a kind of a fairly amoral system. And that is a very strong critique of, you know, completely free capitalism and is why we need to, to regulate and to redistribute, redistribute within that system. But um, the, the puppet master, once again, completely fails to understand that because it encourages us to believe that there's a grand design going on and that's, that, that's why. So it, it somehow manages to take the best criticism of capitalism it's got and then completely undermine it. Um, then the final point is that 
by blaming elites, we, we really shirk a lot of the hard questions of socialism. So what happens if you're saying that there is a powerful elite controlling things, you're never going to be that powerful elite yourself. So the 40% who are best off in society blame the 10%, who blame the 1%, who probably doubt, no doubt blame the 0.1%. Um, and the responsibility of actually uh, doing things is always somebody else's fault. So an interesting example of this was when Chukra Amuna um, had made a bit of an intervention where he talks about how we needed to raise taxes on middle and higher earners to fund the NHS. And a whole group of people on the populist left said that this was a, a quote, neoliberal idea because um, really it should be uh, only the billionaire class who is paying for that. Um, which just f really f is, is a real cop out and almost a form of kind of left nimbyism that you don't really think about these, these questions. Right. Myth three is the golden era. So this is a decline narrative. Um, it's a little bit different to the other two, but what it imagines is a, a sort of socialist Arcadia which has been lost to modernity. So if you, you might remember even in the last week the uh, Zara Sultana's intervention in the House of Parliament in her maiden speech where she talked about 40 years of Thatcherism. Um, some of you might have seen the Ken Loach film Spirit of 45 or other documentaries like Century of the Self. Um, and and the, the whole, this whole neoliberal ide idea of neoliberalism, which is the idea of a, not just of a globalisation having happened and inequality having risen, which no question has happened and has been more difficult to, to, to police and regulate, but is the idea of a kind of all-encompassing sweep to the right on every issue. So if you look at all these headlines down the right-hand side, near th the idea at the root of all of our problems, um, climate change, foreign wars, Donald Trump, every single thing is blamed on this great big shift. And um, The idea is that there was this kind of happy socialist society which was fundamentally undermined uh, and we're now moving into this kind of chrome dystopia. Uh, and the problem with this myth is that it's, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's not that there hasn't been shifts to the right, there clearly has been shifts to the right, but there has also been shifts to the left, not just on a whole set of social issues, but on how we you know, look at issues like um, <coughs> mental health, for instance, or the expectations we have as a society around green issues. There has been big progressive changes. Um, you know, when, when you look at levels of poverty in, um, uh, in the developing world and things, there's been big shifts uh, in the other way. And it's very hard on any of these things to fully get the, t the, the toothpaste back into the tube. Mm. So rather than looking at the, the pros and cons and the way that social change and globalisation has given to the left and taken away from it in equally in, in different ways, the, the, the golden era imagines this kind of this glorious left-wing Eden which is just gradually slid into into nothingness and it means that we come up with policy ideas like Lexit which is the left idea of a left-wing Brexit which says that we kind of retreat back to a protectionist age um, and, and what this also means is that it, there's a real fundamental golden era myopia at the heart of um, at the heart of the Labour project. So always there is this idea that the present we've failed and that, you know, um, well there's a quote up there from uh, uh, the New Statesman in 1950, it's got cut off, but I think it's 1954, which says the Attlee government was the only event of its kind in history which can be contributed nothing new or imaginative to the pool of ideas which illuminate human nature. So this is a, this is a quote and there was plenty of other quotes like that from after the Attlee government. There was similar stuff around um, uh, Harold Wilson. Uh, even figures like Keir, um, Keir Hardy were much more uh, kind of pragmatic at the time than we now like to imagine. But the problem with the golden era myth is that we always get into power and we think, well, we weren't expecting it to feel like this. We thought it would be, it would be different. And then this kind of idea comes in that the people who have polluted the Labour idea and that they're unfit to lace the boots of their socialist forefathers, which means you have this kind of 25-year cycle where the, the betrayal accusation is made 
and then we go back to square one and then 40 years down the line we re rehabilitate these figures and hold them up for the next generation as the you know <laughs> unattainable past um, so what are the arguments against the uh, uh, against the golden era um, so I've done it in a slightly different way in the book with these so I've gone through seven different changes that have happened in the last 70 years or so um, I won't go through them all in as much uh, detail as I has, have with some of the other myths but you've got this big shift that's happened from isolationism to interconnectedness which means that both on left wing and right wing fronts the cha changes have happened as uh, the, the challenges have changed so it is we have higher migration higher expectation that we take refugees higher kind of um, things like the Human right, Rights Act and kind of international policies like that uh, and an international community that, that behaves in different ways to 70 years ago but it's also much harder to regulate fluid global capital um, and an interconnected world has really changed the challenges for labour. Um, second, second one is uh, the idea um, of Local, from us moving from a local scale to a national scale to a global scale so slowly the, the scale of the economy has changed and we haven't really we, you know got the levers to actually deal with the global economy so we need to be looking at more internationalist solutions to problems um, which is why the golden era idea is so counterproductive actually because it takes us away from that internationalism um, the third myth that I look at oh, sorry, the third the third alternative reading is Attlee Thatcher Blair Brexit which I won't go into in too much detail but it's really that we've moved from collectivism to individualism to internationalism and now we're now sliding back to nationalism in the form of Brexit. The fourth is equal rights, equal opportunities, fair outcomes. Now that refers to the rules, the three kind of uh, ideas and what I, lo I look at in that chapter is how um, how he's uh, how we've done on e each of those three benchmarks how successful have we been in actually achieving equal rights equal opportunities and fair outcomes I look at direct challenges to indirect challenges which I think is quite an interesting one because actually what's happened is on a whole set of questions we've become more progressive as a society um, but a lot of the structural problems have remained or in some cases got worse so people are much less snobbish or generally bigoted I think than they were 70 years ago uh, much much less likely to to sneer at somebody or support the existence of a um, an old school tie network but simultaneously a lot of the structural problems remain but we haven't really got, got become very good at talking about the structural problems because they're harder to talk about so we focus on this person's this person's racist or this person's snobbish which in some cases they are but it, the, the nature of the problems have become more intangible and we really haven't caught up. The uh, sixth change is a values shift from global, so from groupish to individualist to post-materialist values. So there has been genuine quite big shifts in the population which has happened in most richer countries as societies become more economically autonomous and then people become more kind of post-materialist. So you wouldn't have had veganuary <laughs> sort of uh, in the 1950s, I don't, I don't think. So th there's a there's been fundamental changes in how people see and engage with things, and that's often just regarded by the left as oh, everyone's moved in this horrible direction towards being consumerist and only cares about money, and that's not really what's happened. It's been much more subtle changes in how people's values have shifted. Uh, and then the, sec the the final one is innocence to awareness, which is the the narrative that actually mass media and scrutiny of politicians and all of these things have fundamentally changed so politicians are actually much more transparent and, and less corrupt I think in a lot of cases thanks to high levels of scrutiny that they're subjected to but uh, on the other kind of side of the ledger we hear much more about their indiscretions when they do happen and we trust them less so that is a kind of strange thing where we're, we're more able to to solve and it's not just about political trust it's about a whole set of issues where we're more equipped to see problems see solutions see things going wrong but actually there's less things going wrong on some issues so it's a kind of it's quite an interesting one I think um, okay the uh, so sorry 
What do these myths share um, and why must we take them on? So I think really Corbynism is a tissue of these three myths and I've come to think that Corbynism stands for almost nothing apart from these three myths. It's entirely about a set of positions in relation to these three myths. Um, and if you look at some of the biggest Labour uh, failures in the last few years, they have come directly through these myths. So on, on Brexit, where I think we needed the European Union was one of the best protections we've got for some of the poorest communities in the UK, best protections against globalisation, we were unable to make that case because of the puppet master view that, as Corbyn put it, the Brexit was a, a Frankenstein project where it was, you know, shadowy, shadowy capitalists in, uh, in smoky rooms. Um, the, and simil similarly, Brexit has come, come from a kind of golden era aversion to an interconnected world. Um, similarly, anti-Semitism comes from a, uh, a kind of dark night reading of the situation in the Middle East as a good and evil, evil struggle where you have to side inexorably with one, uh, along with an attractive puppet master attraction to conspiracy theories. Um, so the, th the three myths share a number of things. What they share is a lack of constructive solutions because they always are about blaming an enemy or um, imagining a kind of cherry-picked version of the past. They create a purity of purpose. They create a kind of a sense of valiant struggle. They create something which is less a utopia than the mirage of a utopia. So, you know, the question of what, what if we win and put all of this stuff into action is, is, never, re is, is never really um, thought about. Um, and it creates a whole set of excuses for failure and for being in opposition. Um, and they're all, all three of the myths are defined by an obstacle. They're defined by an obstacle we're fighting against. And they mean that in a weird way, not only are we less likely to win, but we, we can not win almost. So how can we challenge these myths? Um, there's a number of things. I've, I've got a little picture there of uh, uh, Nye Bevan and, um, and Clement Attlee talking. Uh, and underneath it, a letter that Clement Attlee wrote to um, Nye Bevan after his Tories are lower than um, vermin comment, where he said he pointed out that it was a singularly ill-timed comment, which enabled the doctors to make a, to stage a comeback because they uh, uh, they gave the general impression, the opinion that that we were that the Labour was kind of. Um, dogmatic in this rather than practical. So it's, that was, I just thought was a good example of how this, the dark knight language and the left populist language completely undermines a progressive goal like the NHS. Um, and uh, the creation of the NHS. So taking on the three myths involves a number of things, I think. Firstly is tackling all language which implies bad faith or omnipotent control, tackling the, the language and rather than treating these things as a kind of irritating byproduct of Corbynism, treating them like they're the main event. Secondly, uh, not falling into using the myths ourselves, either towards the right or towards the left. I think there's a, you know, the, the, the expedient thing to do is to say, okay, that's the way the wind is blowing. I'm, I need to show I hate the, hate the Tories and think they're as evil, more evil than any, anyone to try and curry favour and actually we need to reject those instincts and make the case for pluralism. Thirdly, we have to reject the idea that the difference is about degrees of radicalism. There are substantive differences b between uh, people in the Corbynite populist left and the kind of social democrat wing of Labour, but they're not, when it comes to really the core values, I don't think they're the main issue. The main issue is the the conspiracy theories and the nonsense around it. Um, and fourth point, we have to stress the egalitarian possibilities of jettisoning the myths in favour of left pluralism. So what is left pluralism? And this is my final slide, but left pluralism is uh, a democratic socialist policy, poli uh, politics, which subscribes to the following analysis. And I've kind of somehow ended up designing this so it looks a bit like a, a mix of sort of the 1997 pledge card and the sort of Ten Commandments, but it's uh, <laughs> it's got we live in it. So first point, we live in a democracy. This implies pluralism. Um, this implies a difference of opinions, and that that is 
to suggest otherwise is to, to not accept that we live in a democracy. Point two, there are a range of respectable ideals which people strive for. Point three, few policies are inherently moral even if they are right at a given time. So attributing almost any policy with inherently being a good thing, you know, pacifism is always, always good. It's, it may be usually good, it may be good 90% of the time, or nationalisation is always inherently moral. That's, not, that's a, a, a worrying way to see things. Um, society's problems are not usually deliberately authored. That's point four. Point five, the power held by democratic governments, the media and business is finite. It's not to say they have no power, but it's finite and it's probably not as huge as we imagine. Um, point, uh, point six, um, objectivity is more important than political faith in achieving our values. So we need to strive and in the John Rawls sense to see things objectively rather than believing that blind faith is the most important thing. Um, point seven, there has never, there have been advances and setbacks, but there was no moment of original socialism, which was uh, inherently superior to today. Um, point eight, cooperation with other countries is part of the modern world. Point nine, if we derive our passion solely from fighting an enemy, an elite, or a looming dystopia, then we stand for nothing. And point 10 is that actually accepting the, but the above makes us more likely, not less, to achieve progressive egalitarian goals. And the idea is that by signing up to these kind of things, you're somehow selling out. You're, more, you're not, you're doing the opposite. Um, so that's, uh, I hope people found that interesting and that I kind of is a bit of a whistle stop tour of the book. But I think it uh, hopefully helps to explain some of the, the, the themes and um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>